this is in large part how I got involved in Oscar development because I knew Chris and Andy from my time as a postdoc at Cornell, but Chris was developing Oscar for his own work. And I was always using other software programs. Um, and when I started using Oscar, I just really liked the formatting. As Chris said, it's, it's all open, it's in R. Um, you can look at the likelihood code. It matches what Andy published in his book. Um, and so it's, it's really nice to be able to follow along and then see where a more complex likelihood featuring other things that are not currently in the program, how that could be added. And this is an example of that. So Andy published a paper on, on doing this, integrating telemetry data into spatial capture recapture. And really it was an example of, of the concept. Um, but then if you wanted to do it in practice, you needed to use the code that was shared or use some other software like JAGS to fit a Bayesian version of the model. And so we talked about how there was increasing interest because folks usually had telemetry data in some shape or form for their population, um, putting it into Oscar so that it would be a, an easy process to do. And so this lecture here is going to talk about the concept of integrating telemetry into spatial capture, recapture, the linkages uh, between resource use, resource selection functions from telemetry data, and the encounter model in an SCR model. And then we're going to talk a bit about how we do that in Oscar. So the Oscar stuff is all in the vignette. Um, I'm going to open that vignette from Chris's book down at the end, and we'll go through some of it. And all of that code is in the help file for the, um, there's a telemetry help file in Oscar. So um, you can follow along with the lecture in the beginning and then we'll, we'll run through some code at the end. So yesterday, Chris mentioned this idea of scales of selection. And um, so here's an example. I use a, a fish example because I work for the fishery service, but I don't actually do any of this fish stuff myself. So um, this is just for fun. But this is an example of a species that is using space at different scales, right? And so at the highest scale, at the, at the first scale, the distribution of the species across planet Earth is described by some distribution. Then you can think about an individual population that occurs in, in some area of the species distribution made up of individuals using space and then scale down to an individual that is using space within its home range. So this concept of these scales of selection or scales of animal location, a hierarchy of selection processes, uh, comes from a Doug Johnson paper in 1980. I think it's the most cited ecology paper, or at least top three in the journal Ecology. And it's because this concept is has been very important to um, wildlife research. So once again, just to run through this idea, you have this hierarchy of selection processes at the first order of selection, you have the distribution or range of the species on planet Earth. So here we've got polar bears that are distributed around the North Pole. At the second order of selection, you have home range placement from individuals within a population. So here's a map of tiger density. So this is multiple individuals in, in a population defined by some area where you know, individuals can mix and breed. Um, and that's the second order of selection, home range placement. At the third order, you have space use within the home range. So now we're talking about an individual. Here we've got a panda, it's got a home range in the mountains during the summer and down in the valleys during the winter. Um, I like this example actually because it presents a problem for spatial capture recapture models. If you had an individual with two very distinct activity centers at different times of year, this is something that you would need to build into your sampling design. So maybe you would conduct a sampling 
of pandas only in the winter and set up your sampling accordingly, or maybe you would estimate only in the summer. Uh, but it's something that you would have to think about. So the way that we link these scales of selection to spatial capture recapture is pretty straightforward. Um, as you can imagine, we've, we've been talking about this the past couple of days, and, and it, it, it should be pretty clear that the location of home ranges is the density model. That is how many individuals are there in our population and where are they located? At, that's the second order of selection. For the third order of selection, we have the encounter model. This is describing space use within the home range. So we've got this map of density up in the top right and then uh, the encounter probability function based on distance, you can see at the bottom there. So this idea of, of resource selection, this slide here um, is one of two slides I have that could constitute an entire workshop on its own. Um, resource selection functions are heavily used in wildlife research. They've been around for a while. Um, this Brian Manley book, I think I cited the, the 2002 book. Um, the original, I think, is from 93 or maybe even earlier than that. There's been several, um, several versions, se several editions at this point. Um, but this, this is really the, you know, kind of the go-to primary literature on resource selection functions. And this concept of a, a function that is proportional to the probability of use by an organism. So this is use of resources on a landscape. And the way that we typically do this is by taking our landscape and representing it as a raster with grid cells. So that each grid cell, each pixel, has a value for some feature on the landscape and you're interested in how animals are selecting to be in a pixel uh, based on the values in that pixel. To do this, folks typically have telemetry data. Um, it's the most common approach to estimating resource selection functions. So this, um, the, these telemetry data are specific to individuals. Individuals are the sampling unit. People typically use a use versus availability design. So you have to determine, all right, where were the individuals located based on the telemetry locations? And then what pixels or resources were available based on um, typically two different scales. So either the entire landscape that describes the population. So every animal that is in your sample that's, uh, that's considered des the design two approach to resource selection functions. The other approach, design three, is where you restrict availability to be within the home range of the individual um, whose RSF you're trying to estimate. So to say that a resource is available to an animal that is you know, a distance away so far that that animal would never be able to get there seems pretty silly, right? Um, so design three is, is potentially a, a, the more popular design. But it also, it's because it describes how animals are using space um, more accurately. So what Andy described in this 2013 paper was that spatial capture recapture and resource selection functions are derived from the same basic underlying model of space usage. And in an SCR model, we have an observed use of traps, which you could consider to be similar to a thinned telemetry process. So the major um, currency in a spatial capture recapture design is spatial recaptures, right? The more spatial recaptures you get, the, the better your estimate of sigma, um, the, the more precision you have in the encounter model and thus in your density model. We're trying to get spatial recaptures and, and Gates will talk about designs that, that can maximize that. Um, 
with telemetry, you've got a whole bunch of, of spatial recaptures. And so we're trying to leverage that information and recognizing that both the telemetry locations and the observed use of traps are representing third order selection. So the encounter model for traps is describing third order selection. Once you take away features like, you know, if, if there are um, aspects of your sampling that are, are unique to the traps, you'd need to account for that first. But in many of these designs, these non-invasive designs where animals are, are being encountered at traps because they're using that space, then you can consider that process, that encounter model, really to be um, mostly encapsulating variation due to third order selection. So how do we do this? How do we integrate a spatial capture recapture model with a resource selection function? Well, if we consider that the use frequency from the telemetry data is a multinomial random variable that's conditioned on the sample size, the number of total fixes that you had for an individual, then that use frequency is a function of the pixel location and the activity center for the individual. So this model here shows what's the probability of using pixel X given that your activity center is in pixel S. And so for any given pixel X, it is that that probability is described um, by this ratio. And so this, this lambda is the same type of model that we have in a spatial capture recapture design. You'll notice that we've seen this equation before. So here, this log lambda, um, this would be the Poisson model. Um, but what we're going to talk about here is uh, the comp complementary log log, which is just a kind of a form of that exponential. So the important features here are that availability is described by alpha one. So that is, what is the probability that you use a pixel based on the distance between that pixel and where your activity center is? And then alpha two is describing the probability of using a resource based on the value of that resource in pixel X. So, we can define the probabilities of the observed data for both the telemetry and SCR as follows. So this is what I was referencing before. Um, the fixed data are a multinomial random variable where the total sample size is that capital R, and then the probability of using those different pixels is described by pi. And this is for the individuals in your telemetry data set. So for I and one through capital N, uh, telemetry there. Whereas the SCR data, we've seen this likelihood uh, multiple times now. As I was previously describing, the way we formulate it here is with a complementary log log function or a hazard rate. So one minus the exponential of uh, the negative lambda here. That is describing, that takes the count data essentially. If you had count data, let's say um, in an example where you could have multiple captures at a trap, but you don't know if there were more than one. You only know that there was at least one. So hair snares are a, a frequent example. Um, this is taking that expected count and turning it into a probability. So this likelihood is for all the individuals that you observed in your spatial capture recapture data. One thing to note here is that this multinomial probability for the telemetry data doesn't include alpha naught. So alpha naught gets canceled out from the numerator and denominator, and it's simply a, a function of the sampling rate of the telemetry device which doesn't really matter, it's, it's a design feature, right? So the sample size is going to change based on how often 
if you had a GPS collar, how often the fixes are, are being calculated or, or um, recorded versus if it's a VHF collar, how often are you going out and finding a location? All of those things are design features that, that don't matter. Once you've got the sample size for that individual, that's all you need here. The alpha knot is obviously very important for the encounter rate of the camera traps because that is what gets you the estimate of the number of individuals that you did not observe. Um, it's an important feature of the capture recapture design. But this is just to say that there is no, that the only parameters that we care about in terms of linking between the two data sets are this alpha one and this alpha two. So the availability of resources based on distance, the availability of pixels based on their distance from the activity center, and then the relative probability of using a pixel based on uh, its value. Trying to think if there were other slides we've presented thus far with integrals, um, which are some of people's favorite part of statistics. But um, this is just to show that the marginal likelihoods are computed. So the way we do this in, in Oscar is that we remove S by integration. So we consider the probabilities across all pixels of S for a given individual. We remove that and then the what we get is the marginal distribution of the observed data so for the ser data we're integrating over all possible activity centers for an individual and then the probability of observing captures at different traps is conditional on the all the potential locations for that activity center and the alpha parameters of the model and then for the RSF data, it's, it's very similar. Um, we're integrating over S again, and we're looking, we're trying to understand the probability of observing the fixed locations where we observed them based on the activity center and again, those, those alpha parameters. So the two likelihoods for the SER data and for the RSF um, are simply combined if we assume that each, uh, that the individuals in, in each data set are independent. I'm gonna talk about um, an approach for when that's not the case, but here it's pretty simple. When it is the case, we just multiply those two likelihoods and we can calculate the likelihood of the parameters uh, for resource selection based on the observed data for the camera traps or, or whatever design you're using for spatial encounters and the data that you collected from the individuals with, with collars. Now here I've simplified these likelihoods by not including the estimation of N because again, that only comes from the SCR likelihood. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're getting that from alpha naught, which you can see here is part of the likelihood for SER. It is not part of the RSF likelihood. And so that doesn't change at all. It's the same as, as a standard SER model. So the reason to do this and what Andy showed in his paper was that um, there are benefits to in, incorporating these data. For one thing, it can improve estimates of density which are you know, typically the thing we care about the most, um, but it also improves estimates of other parameters. So the, the big thing is the increased precision for sigma. Imagine now, I mean, it, if you consider that adding telemetry is like adding just a whole bunch of spatial recaptures, then the benefit should be clear because those spatial recaptures are really um, the, the part of of your data collection that allows this model to work well. The, the important thing that it does, aside from just improving the estimates in terms of precision, is that it can reduce the unexplained heterogeneity and encounter probability. So individuals are using space 
due to features on the landscape, if we don't have that in our model for SER, then it can result in, in bias. Now, incidentally, it seems like that bias is not often a huge problem, but it really depends. And when you consider that, you're, that the individuals in your population are using space for various reasons, um, I think all of us can come up with reasons why we would want to account for that in our spatial capture recapture design. And the issue is that typically the number of traps that you have in an SCR design is simply too few for estimating a good relationship with resources. So in Andy's paper, he showed that you can do that. If you don't have telemetry data, you can still have this concept of resource use built into the encounter model. Um, but what I'm going to talk about in, in a moment here is that it, you, you typically don't have the power to do that, unfortunately. So that's what telemetry integration can allow. So this has come up quite a bit when folks are asking about integrating telemetry into SER. Um, you know, lo and behold, the same individuals in your telemetry data set are those that are being camera trapped or, or detected by some other means in the trap design. And so what do you do about that? Um, for one thing, it doesn't seem to be hugely problematic depending on your sample sizes. So if you've only got a few collared individuals, it's probably not moving the needle much if you consider that they're independent and you don't account for that. But if you have a pretty good collection of collared individuals, then you are inflating your inferences in terms of what you're learning about individuals using space because individuals are, are, that are using space based on um, the collar. So the collar data has a collection of individuals using space. If those same individuals are in your camera trap data, then you're inflating the number of individuals that you're, you're using to make these inferences. So it's, it's just a form of you know, pseudo replication. You're going to have um, the, the precision of your parameter estimates is probably going to be better than it should be. Um, and so, you know, depending on the situation, if, if you've got a lot of individuals in your telemetry data set and dependence is, is probably, or independence is not a good assumption, uh, then it needs to be accounted for. So I wrote this paper with um, a couple colleagues at University of New Hampshire. And the two things that it did, aside from accounting for dependence and adding this to Oscar, um, we also looked at multi-scale resource selection. So this idea that, look, there could be resource use differences, variation in resource use that it would be important to account for in the model. But if you don't have telemetry data, you don't typically have the power to do that with just the camera trap data. So what happens when, when you add telemetry data and you are able to fit more complex resource selection functions? So how do we account for dependence? Well, what we need to do is consider the fact that, I guess I, I could have mentioned this earlier too, the other, the other benefit of, of taking the dependence into account is that the activity centers for your collared individuals are going to be um, precisely estimated, right? Because you'll have many locations for that individual. So you'll have a pretty good idea of where the activity center is. And that could be useful for the spatial capture recapture model. It's just reducing uncertainty. It's giving you a better point pattern to work with um, because instead of some of these individuals' points being 
you know, pretty sparsely estimated. Um, you've got some that are, that are very precise. And so that, that could be useful. Um, so what we need to do when we, when we calculate the marginal likelihood is we have to integrate over S simultaneously for the telemetry and the SCR data. And that's what this marginal likelihood is, is showing. Um, we're integrating over all the possible activity center locations and using that in our estimation of the probability for each data set. So then the joint likelihood is a combination of the collared individuals where the probability of, of um, you're calculating the probability of both data sets and then the uncollared individuals. So the second part of the likelihood, the joint likelihood here, you're taking the product over the, the um, NTEL plus one. So this is saying, all right, let's say you had 10 collared individuals that all showed up in a data set of 30 um, camera trapped individuals. So this is just taking that portion, individual 11 through 30, and calculating um, the likelihood only over the spatial capture recapture data. And again, in these equations, we're, we're ignoring the estimation of, of N. So what I showed, here's an example from that paper. Um, this is one individual and it had a collar and it was camera trapped twice. So on the right, when we don't include the telemetry data, we've only got those two spatial recaptures. So um, the crosses are traps and the black dots are the locations of the individual based on the device. So on the right, we just, we just have um, the, the two locations based on camera trap data. When we include the telemetry data on the left, we've got a lot more locations. And so the estimate of the activity center is just far more precise on the left. You can see that there's a high probability or a relatively higher probability that it occurs in, you know, three or four pixels there. Whereas on the right, that probability is pretty dispersed across the landscape. Um, and so this is showing one of the benefits of accounting for this dependence. The other benefit of just including telemetry data, so whether there's dependence or not, the benefit of, of having a resource selection function estimated with telemetry data is that you have more power because you've got a larger sample size. And so you can better explore variation in resource use. So this table is simply showing that when we added the telemetry data, we were able to capture more features in, in uh, movement than we could capture without the telemetry data. So as an example, the movement scale, sigma, when we didn't have telemetry data, there was no power to estimate a difference between the two years of data that we had and between males and females. When we included the telemetry data, in fact, we found that there was variation uh, for both year and sex and the, the combination, the interaction between the two. Same with encounter rate. Encounter rate could not estimate a relationship with the different features on the landscape. We had two, uh, two covariates and then a quadratic function for one of the covariates. And we were able to include those, uh, that variation when we included the telemetry data. Another result of this was that here we, we've got maps. The top row is the, you can see the expected density on the landscape. And then the bottom row is variation in capture probability. Now, the reason that there is no map on the right for no telemetry is that we didn't have variation in encounter probability when we didn't include telemetry. We didn't have the power to estimate it. 
So the top model, when we didn't have telemetry, was just a solid surface for capture probability. Well, you can see that that was not suggested to be the case when we had telemetry. And so we've got variation in encounter probability across the landscape based on resources. That then manifests in the estimate of density across the landscape. So back to the top row on the left, when we include telemetry, there is variation due to coniferous forest, um, but it's, it's modified, it's, it's modulated, you could say, compared to when we don't include telemetry, because some of that variation is actually due to encounter probability, right? So individuals are both selecting to be in coniferous forest in terms of where they're setting up their home range, they're also spending more time in the portions of their home range that have more coniferous forest. So that second feature is, is missing when we don't include the telemetry data. And the result is that it suggests there's more variation in terms of density than would be suggested when we include the telemetry data. So this is that other slide I mentioned that could be an entire workshop on its own. Um, there is a, a rich literature on animal movement that incorporates all kinds of features, primarily the serial autocorrelation that occurs when you have fixed data where individuals are moving about the landscape at a temporal scale small enough that that each step from point A to point B is, uh, it's more nuanced, right, than, than you would consider if your fix rate was every day or every week. Uh, the latter is more typical of VHF telemetry. So in the old days, I say the old days, um, <laughs> there are plenty of folks still collecting VHF data because it's, it's still cheaper. Um, and it depends on the organism. But in the past, when you had a VHF collar and you're trying to get telemetry locations, you know, you were lucky to be able to get a fix once or twice a week. Um, in which case, those data are more indicative of movement around a home range that is a, a random sampling. Whereas when you have a fix rate on the hour or smaller time scales, then you have to consider that what's available to an individual when it, when it chooses to move to a new location is on a much smaller scale than what would be considered under design three, for instance, of the resource selection function. Um, it's th their entire home range is not available to them on a small time scale. So, in order for us to be able to integrate telemetry data into spatial capture recapture, we have to make some assumptions about movement. And, and the primary one is that these locations are a random sample of the individual using its home range around its activity center. So its movement is around the activity center S. And we need to consider that there are spatial and temporal scales that will affect the data that you obtain from, from a design where individuals are wearing collars. And what that means about inferences regarding resource use and, and what you would expect to observe from a camera trapping design. Um, so we, you know, we can certainly talk more about this. This is um, a complex topic. The other part to, to address here is that one strategy, and Andy talked about this in his paper, they took the bare data that they had and thinned it until they only had 10% of the available fixes from the GPS collars. So they reduced a lot of that data and it works because there's still a rich amount of information in the framework of spatial capture recapture when you add that many spatial captures. Um, the problem is you're, you're assuming then the serial autocorrelation that occurs in the fixed data are removed when you thin, and that's probably pretty reasonable if you thin it as much as, as they did in their paper. Um, 
but this is this is kind of a this is a topic that often gets discussed on the Google group um, because it's important for understanding how how you can incorporate your telemetry data into a spatial capture recapture design. And then finally, there's a, a recent paper here that talks about the link between resource selection and step selection models and this historical tension between the two because folks found when they fit step selection models, they would not um, capture features about resource use that were typical from a similar resource selection model. And so why is that? And um, I'm not gonna talk about that here, uh, but this is a, a technical paper that, that describes the link between the two. Finally, I'm going to stop here and take questions, um, but then we'll go into the book down in the vignette, which is also available in the help file here in the Oscar package. So if you, if you look for question mark telemetry, you'll get the help page and a bunch of R code is there. And that R code is replicated in the vignette. Yeah, so in the book down, one of the chapters is a vignette on integrated resource selection function SCR models in Oscar. Um, I've got a bit of an introduction there that talks about some of the things I said in the lecture. Um, it's got some citations. And then we get into simulating capture and telemetry data, mostly using the R script that Andy wrote in his 2013 paper. So that paper has a supplement with mostly the same code. I made some tweaks. As Chris said, um, Andy really loves ggplot. So we decided to, to put some ggplot in this. And, uh, <laughs> and then we fit the data to, um, to the New York Black Bear data set from that paper. So this vignette has both a simulation of, of fake data that shows you some things, and then um, we fit it to the Black Bear data. And this is mostly to show you, you know, the workflow that you would use um, in Oscar. So the first bit, um, similar to yesterday when Andy simulated a, a landscape for bear food, um, we do a similar thing here. We plot that, and then we set up some some values for sample size, model parameters. Um, let's see, we've got four individuals with telemetry devices and a number of fixes per individual is 40. And then we say that the population size in our landscape is 50 individuals. So then we set up a seven by seven trap array, 49 traps and identify raster cells to which they correspond so that we can get a spatial covariate value for each of those 49 traps. Then we simulate the capture data. Um, a lot of this is pretty standard stuff and we simulate the telemetry data. One thing we have to do that does relate to your own workflow if you had telemetry data, and this question comes up a lot, is how do we define the state space when you have animals that have telemetry locations that are pretty far off of your trapping grid? And the answer to that is, well, just expand your state space, right? So you can fit a spatial capture recapture model with a state space that is way too big and a huge waste of computation. <laughs> and it'll still give you the estimates that you, that you need. Um, just what happens is when you get far away from your trapping grid, you're, you, you, there's no information, right? And so the pixels that are far, far away from the trapping grid, if they were included as part of the state space, they would simply take mean values um, for density unless that you had some kind of density variation, in which case now you're kind of, you'd, you'd be combining 
um, prediction or extrapolation during the model fitting process. So, you know, it's, it's much better to fit your model to the area where you have information, come up with estimates. And then if you wanted to generate density estimates in a new location, um, do that separately after the fact. But you could conceivably include an entire area next to your trapping grid when you fit the model and you would get predictions for those grid cells. Um, but as I said, it's, it's, you don't generally want to do that because um, it's going to be a computational waste. You're going to be sitting around waiting for output when um, that's not really necessary. Now, it is possible, Chris, I haven't thought about this, but maybe Trim S makes that no longer a problem. Um, but I, I, I have a feeling that's not the case. If you have more, we're, we're constantly dealing with issues where your model is taking a long time to fit. And one of the reasons could be a state space that has a resolution that is too high. The pixels are too small and therefore you have too many pixels. So um, any, any approach you can take to reduce those number of pixels is usually a pretty good approach for getting faster computation. Um, but it's constantly a balance between how small your pixel is and how many you have and, and what you need based on your data and, and the kinds of models you're trying to fit and the animals, the, the species that you're um, working with. So all of that long aside is to say that it's arbitrary to add pixels to your state space, even if you don't have trapping, um, any traps in that area. And you need to do it if you've got captures or um, detections from the telemetry device. So that's, that's really the strategy. If you've got an individual, individual with a collar that, that is off the trapping grid beyond your state space, um, you need to extend that to accommodate that individual. So what happens when we simulate this is we just restrict all of the telemetry locations to be within the state space that we started with only to make things easier. So I've had some folks ask me about this, um, you know, why, why do we need to do this? And um, it's simply to, to make the setup easier because all of this is simulated. We don't really care about it. So let's just make sure when we throw individuals out that they're all pretty much in the trapping grid so that we don't have to make any changes to our, our state space. So that's what we do here. So we sample some locations that could be the activity center for an individual with a collar for each of those four individuals. And then the other part we do um, that goes into the dependent models is we keep track of where in the capture history these individuals were that have the collars. So in our simulation here, the four individuals that have radio collars are also individuals that show up in our capture data. And so in order to fit the dependent model, you need to tell Oscar what the row number is, what, you know, what is the, the individual number in the capture data that corresponds to each of your telemetry individuals. This is another part of the workflow um, that I've been asked about multiple times. The best thing to do is to sort. If you had, let's say you had cap, uh, collared individuals that weren't captured, you don't need to specify this cap tail vector. You don't need to tell Oscar where they are on the capture data because they're not there. So all you need to do is say, here's the location in the capture data of these individuals that were captured, which means you had better sort your data so that your telemetry data matrix that has the use frequencies in each pixel for each individual, you need to have that sorted so that your top individuals are all the individuals that were captured in the data set. So this is something I can, I can explain again in a different way if anyone has questions. Um, but that's an important point. And that's, that's what this, this cap tell vector is just trying to keep track of who 
out of out of the telemetered individuals who was also in the capture data and where do they show up in that capture history so let's see i talk about the multinomial model for resource selection and we use that to simulate fixed frequencies so here's another important point that um I think it was Tyler was asking about, you know, how do you how do you take the telemetry data and, and make it work um, with SCR? You need to distribute those fixes as counts in each pixel on your landscape. Um, I'm gonna do that in the real data for, for New York Bears. Right here, we don't even bother, we, we essentially don't, we don't simulate, um, telemetry locations, we simulate counts of telemetry locations within pixels. So this, this chunk of code here is just distributing counts to different pixels based on the resource selection function and where the activity center for that individual is located. So we double check that the um, the average fixed locations match up with the activity centers. So this, we've got our four individuals with collars that were also captured. These chunk of, this chunk of XY locations is the average, um, the average location in the capture data. We're just making sure that that matches up with, um, with the telemetry data. So the next part, we look at um, the predicted hey Dan. space use. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you said you'd be happy to say something again uh, if it wasn't quite clear. And I think I missed it as well. Um, so that identifying which individuals um, have colors and which are like the dependency between the captured guys and the, sorry, the captured individuals and the collared individuals. Yep. So you can, for every colored individual, you can specify which individual they are in the trapping data. But how, how is it you um, tell the function, or how do, how do you tell the fitting function that a colored individual wasn't trapped? Like where do they go? Um, it's 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 just by omission. So if you had ten collars, and four of those collars were captured in your trapping array um, you just you you only feed the captel vector only has four numbers corresponding to those four captured individuals where they are in the capture history so that, that's why i was saying it and this could be modified um, I, I can imagine a couple of ways to make this maybe more robust than forcing people to sort their individuals to the top of um, of their telemetry data but yeah, if, if the other six individuals in that data set, they just don't have information fed to the fitting function um, regarding where they are in the capture history. It's just, it's, it's an omission, right? Because they're not in the capture history. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So CapTel will take the form, it's a vector of, um, location in the capture history for each of the collared individuals that were captured so in my example four out of the ten were captured you'll have a collection of data for those all ten individuals that goes into the model but captel only has four numbers just to to make clear you know where in the capture history the first four individuals are located and so that's why you got to sort the telemetry data such that um, the first four individuals are are the ones that were captured. Well, like I said, I, I, you know, the more I've helped people with this, I'm realizing it's kind of it's something that hangs people up, and so um, I'm sure there's a way to to do this that might be better. For example, you could provide a, a vector of length ten. 
and have an NA if it doesn't have a captured individual, and then it would, then then that's fine, right? Right. Yeah. Um, I think you know the issue is that in the likelihood function we we do some shorthand, right? And so um, it, we just need to to change what that looks like. So here I've got the, again, we're working with the simulated data. We've got four individuals with collars and I've plotted the expected encounter rates, the lambdas for each of the collared individuals based on their location and the resources on the landscape. So this is not, these, these four surfaces here are solely based on the S, the activity center that has been simulated for that individual, and the spatial covariate on the landscape. So this isn't observed data, this is expected values in each pixel, the relative use um, or, or um, the probability that that pixel will be used by the individual based on its, on its activity center and the resource. So what's kind of neat is, you know, in this example, um, I think X1, the first individual there, has a pixel with a high probability, and it's because it is a, a high value or a good value of the resource right near the center of, of its activity center. So um, that's an area that's going to be used a lot. Whereas for individual X4, they may be in a section of habitat that is not so good, or maybe it's, it's even, um, it's similar. It, it, it could, I just haven't thought about this, whether it matters if, um, if it's all good or it's all bad, you could still have a, a pretty dispersed surface here. Um, I guess we could just check. Yeah, so, right, the, in the bottom left corner of our simulated landscape here, the covariate value is low, and so that individual's space use is, is fairly dispersed. So, the next part here, um, we plot the capture data. So this is kind of like a, a spider plot here where for each individual that was, so, so all the gray squares are activity centers for the 50 individuals in our, our landscape. So we know those locations because we simulated them, but we only observed captures for the individuals that have lines connecting them, those squares to a trap. So the trapping grid is the, the black crosses in the middle there, seven by seven. So for each square, there's a line going to a trap if that square, if that individual got captured. The gray lines and gray circles are all individuals that were captured that didn't have radio collars. And the four colored ones are the ones that had radio collars. So this is just the capture data. This doesn't include any of the telemetry fixes. Um, and it's just showing what that, what that spider plot looks like from the perspective of, you know, some of the individuals have collars and some don't. So then we get into how to fit these models in OSCAR. Um, one of the things that we have to do is, in Andy's paper, um, he had simulated data that wasn't occasion specific. So it was counts and we need those counts to be distributed across occasions. Um, and so we do that here. This is just you know, a way of making that code work by pretending that those, these encounters happened in different occasions. Um, but this is, just, this is just a little chunk to make that simulation work better. So we load the Oscar package one point that gets discussed a lot, that's important, how do you create 
your surface for resource selection. Um, the thing I commonly do is just use the state space. So the resolution is the same. The values for different resources are, are the same. Um, but it could be a different surface. It could be a smaller, uh, sorry, it could have a lower, a higher resolution. So smaller pixels. Um, this is something that Chris does with the asymmetric space use model. We haven't explored some of that, but it's, it's possible. Um, the easiest thing is to have an, a state space with a, a resolution that is good enough to describe variation resources within the home range, and then simply use that as your RSF uh, data frame. So the big part here, telemetry data get packed together. Um, you need the fixed frequency matrix. So that has for each in the, the matrix, each row is an individual and each column is a pixel on the landscape. And that fixed frequency matrix describes the number of fixes that occur in that pixel. And that's where I'm saying, if you were to have 10 individuals in that matrix, four of which were captured in the capture data, you'd wanna make sure that those four get floated to the top of your matrix so that they are individuals one, two, three, and four in the fixed frequency matrix. And then you need to tell Oscar also, if there's dependence, where those four, those first four individuals show up in the capture data with the CapTel object. Just like other parts of Oscar, we're using lists um, so we've got the lists of lists format. Here I'm using make the make SCR frame function. Um, with the bare data, we use data to Oscar. But, um, you know, and, that, and that's because we simulated the data here. So we don't have an EDF, an encounter data frame. We had a matrix of the captures. Um, but it doesn't matter which approach you use, you can add the telemetry either way. So then we fit some models and there's different things to specify. So for one thing, um, the encounter model here we've specified as CLOG. This is complementary log log or hazard rate. Um, you could also use the Poisson encounter model but I would, I would not recommend the binomial model um, because that is not using an exponential function. It's, it's on a different, it's a different link function, right? It's on logit scale. And so if you have binary data for your trapping data, um, you can just use the, the clog function here and that should work fine. Um, but that's something that, that could be discussed more. So here I'm comparing the fit of two different models, one where this line is, is not commented out that has the RSFDF specified. It says RSF true, which is saying we are, we are interested in fitting a resource selection function. And that here we're assuming the telemetry data are independent. So we can fit those models, compare the the parameter estimates. Um, there's an increase in precision you can see for sigma. So without the telemetry data, um, the standard error for sigma is 0.16. It goes down to 0.03 when you include the telemetry data. Um, it's also closer to the truth, although we kind of, you know, played around with things here to make sure that the simulated values um, gave us a, uh, a result that indicated that the telemetry data integration was superior. Um, but you could also prove that with a simulation. And that, that's really what you would have to do because there's many moving parts here that are, are um, stochastic. And unfortunately, in any given situation, you could conceivably have um, the integrated model producing estimates that are not as good as a non-integrated model. Um, the point is that on average, there will be improvement. And 
And here, I mean, the simulation is pretty small. It's a small trapping array, low number of individuals. There are a number of components here that are, um, you know, more of a toy example. And so you wouldn't expect it to always be better in this toy example. So then the last part here, we fit the dependent model. And um, I'm going to skip through some of this just to show, you know, when you come up with the predicted activity centers, which what's kind of cool is that you can see when with the independent model, um, those predictions are, are just a lot more uncertain than in the dependent model where we've included the telemetry data for individuals that show up in the capture data. And so their estimated activity center from the capture from the, from the SER model is, is much more precise. So in this independent model, these four individuals were individuals with radio collars, but those locations were not tied to them. The, the increased precision of sigma came from the inclusion of the radio collar data, but we didn't know that those individual locations from the collars were attributed to these captured individuals. So that's why you see this dispersed estimate of the activity centers for these four, because while the collar data were included, they weren't linked to these four individuals. So when you do link them, obviously, you know, that prediction um, gets much better. So I won't go over this last part. This is an application to the New York Black Bear data set. Um, but the, the two things I'll, I'll point out, one is that here we've got the fixed data as XY locations from the GPS collars. And what you need to do to make it usable for Oscar is use this telemetry processor function. And this takes those fixes and disperses them into the grid cells or pixels um, that are indicative of that XY location based on your RSFDF. So you have to tell the telemetry processor, here's my resource selection function state space. Again, it could be the same state space as you're using uh, in the SCR model, but you need to give it that state space with pixels defined. And then this processor takes those XY locations and tallies the count across each pixel. And then I also talk about, um, I guess a, a little earlier, I said here we're, we're only keeping 10% of the fixes based on the previous discussion about serial autocorrelation and, um, and, and problems with that. The other part is that we're using data to Oscar here. So here's the typical setup with an encounter data frame. All these arguments are specified and just like with the make um, dot SCR frame function, you're feeding the RSFDF and the telemetry as objects into this before you fit the model. And um, I think the model fit here took 28 minutes. That's one thing to note is that depending on how much telemetry data you have, you will definitely increase the computation time. Um, but usually it is worth it. 